Good evening and welcome to the December 17, 2018 regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council. First item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to invite Edgar Olivas from Quince Orchard High School to come to the podium and lead us in the, in the pledge and after everyone can please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Next item on our agenda is reflection. I'd like to call for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda is our annual election of a city council vice president. I'm going to turn it over to current vice president, Ryan Spiegel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's been a really good year uh, during my uh, latest uh, tenure as council vice president this past year. I want to appreciate everyone and, and thank everybody for their support during the couple of occasions where the mayor wasn't able to attend and I was um, honored to have to step into uh, those shoes um, and I want to thank staff in particular for being uh, quick to provide the support in those instances but a uh, very smooth and successful year but it's time to pass the baton um, as is our tradition of uh, switching the council vice presidency annually and so uh, it's my honor to uh, nominate our colleague uh, council member Wu who, whose time has come and I think would do a great job um, as a council vice president in the coming year. So I uh, move that we um, elect council, uh, pre council member Wu as council vice president for the uh, 2019 year. Second. Okay, hey, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Uh, let's, let's, give council, let's give council vice president Wu a round of applause. We're clapping for you. You don't. <laughs> I'm clapping for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, you can do your acceptance speech during from the mayor and council if you if you wish. We're going to move on to approval of minutes. We have two sets of a minute of minutes to approve uh, this evening. The first being from the regular session held on November 5th. And I wanted to before we vote on that, I wanted to ask our city attorney since we had two council members present, and I'm assuming everybody else abstains, is it okay to have approved these minutes with just, just two by votes? The majority of those who are present. Yes. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. I hope you guys agree on this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hope so, too. Okay. Um, what's move, move approval. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed and any abstentions? Abstentions. Okay, so that, that carries 2 0 with three abstentions. Council Member Sales, Sesma, and Wu. Uh, next, we have the minutes from regular session on December 3rd. What is the pleasure of the council? Go ahead. Move approval. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed and any abstentions? Abstain. Sales. Okay. Um, so, uh, that carries 3-0 with two abstentions, council members Spiegel and Sales. Okay. Next, we have a whole, we have a few sets of appointments. The first being to the Ethics Commission. What's the pleasure of the council? So, Mayor, I'll move a resolution of the council confirming your appointment to the Ethics Commission for uh, Donna Dixon, uh, term to expire December 2021. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, carries 5-0. Next, we have uh, appointment to the Animal Control Board, or reappointment. Mr. Mayor, I'm going to move approval of the resolution of City Council confirming a reappointment of Mary Jo LaFrance, the public at large member three to a three-year term expiring December 2021. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, carries 5-0. Next, we have... Um, a reappointment to the Commission on Landlord Tenant Affairs. Mayor, I'd like to move approval 
to the reappointment of David Meat uh, for a term to last until 1221. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm recusing myself from that vote. Okay. Um, so yes. that carries four zero one recu mm -hmm. recusal counts is the same as same abstention. As abstention, abstention I would right. imagine, okay. But okay. Uh, and, and that's just because my, my law firm has a relationship with Mr. May. Fair enough. Um, and next we have an appointment to the Community Advisory Committee. What is the pleasure of the council? Mayor, I move the resolution confirming your appointment to the Community Advisory Committee for uh, a term of two years expiring November 2020 for Nora Fitzpatrick. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, carries 5-0. Is anybody who was just appointed to anything present? Uh, if so, raise your hand. Yes, yeah, please. Donna Dixon. Donna Dixon, okay. Uh, let's give Donna a great round of applause. <laughs> and to the others, we'll thank them when we see them. Um, thank you all. Next, we have presentations. We have one presentation tonight. It is uh, for the uh, Gaithersburg and Quince Orchard Latin dance groups. Um, if, if everybody affiliated with the groups can come join me at the podium, that would be fantastic. Okay, we're going to see if I, if I get all the details right here, and if not, um, then you guys are going to feel free, you're going to have a chance to correct me. But we had the 19th annual Montgomery County Public Schools Latin Dance Competition was held on November 19th, 2018 at Strathmore. Uh, MCPS students represent their high schools in eight categories, bachata, couples, merengue, salsa, and cha-cha, uh, parent student, uh, Jack and Jill, you guys will have to explain what Jack and Jill is, I don't know, <laughs> um, best in show, junior and senior, and alumni. The event uh, preserves cherished traditions of the varied countries which are represented in all Montgomery County Public Schools. So we are very we were extremely uh, proud and, and happy to learn that both uh, the Gaithersburg High School team and the Quince Orchard teams did extremely well in this in this competition. So Gaithersburg High School's Sabor Latino placed first in Merengue, Salsa, Best in Show Senior, and Jack and Jill divisions, and third in the Bachata division. Um, Quince Orchard was second in Cha Cha, third in Merengue, second in Salsa, second place best in show senior division um, so we wanted to bring them here to to recognize uh, their achievements and to thank them for representing our, our community uh, with with such grace and and uh, let's give them a great round of applause We have we have one certificate prepared. Come on, come on up, come on up. <laughs> if you're if you're involved in the dance team, come on up. Uh, so we have one certificate prepared, and others are 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 in the process of being prepared. Um, but we're going to hold this one up for you know for our, our photo op here, and then I'm going to give you guys a chance to talk. So let me put this right in the middle. You guys hold this up. And I'll come over on the side. Yeah, good. I'll let you facilitate that. You definitely like you're the mayor or something. <laughs> All right, everybody. One, two, three. Thanks. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> we can see yeah, it up there. Yeah, yeah. Give me a fourth one now. <laughs> Okay, I want to 
give you guys a, a chance to say a few words if, you're, if you'd like. Um, you know, not everybody, but maybe one from each team. <laughs> if, if you like, please. Yeah, come on up. Introduce yourself. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Viola Clune, and I'm on Quince Orchard's Latin dance team, so I'll just read you a little bit about our team and then a little bit about myself personally. So the Quince Orchard High School competitive Latin dance team is known as Juntos. Juntos has a dual identity since it means together in Spanish and as an American acronym represents Just Unite Now, that's our solution. Our team members come from Central and South America as well as the Caribbean and the United States of America. The mission of our dance program is to elevate and nurture students' leadership and personal growth through dance, allowing young adults to discover the power of their artistic expression and thrive throughout all facets of their lives. And then I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Viola Clune. I'm 16 years old and attend Quince Orchard High School, and I will be graduating with the class of 2020. In order to be a member of Juntos, one must maintain a 2.0 GPA. However, our sponsoring teacher, Mrs. Mohan, holds us to a higher standard. She prints out our grades every two weeks and makes a point to speak with students if she doesn't feel that they are achieving at their highest potential. Being held to a higher standard has motivated me even more to achieve at the highest possible level. In addition, I have been forced to learn how to balance a sometimes hectic schedule between three to four hours of practice and for AP classes, laziness or procrastination is not an option. Being so busy as a result of dance, I believe, has helped me to maintain higher grades as I am more focused and motivated. I am eternally grateful for the opportunities that I have been presented with as a result of joining Juntos. I have had the opportunity to be trained by two professional dancers, Irene Holtzman and Edwin Sorto. Their commitment to our growth and success has allowed me to develop my dance skills and te techniques as well as my confidence as a performer. Dancing has become my passion and something that I am so thankful to have in my life. In the future, I would love to keep dancing and through hard work and commitment, I hope to one day be as good as those who have been an inspiration to me. Dance is something that I will carry with me for a lifetime and not something that I will stop with when I graduate high school. I have seen the profound impact it has had on me, and one thing I would love to do is to teach kids how to dance, as I know the effect it can have on their lives. It's not required, but you know, we wanted to get a chance to do it. Roles are season captain, so. Uh, okay. Hi, my name is Raul Rodriguez, and I'm a senior at Gettysburg High School. And I would like to thank the city of Gettysburg for this opportunity to um, show uh, a gratitude to us, to Quince Orchard, and to the Latin dance competition. Um, this competition has helped me, and my teammates, and my team to grow individually and grow together as a unit because we don't we don't work as one, but we're all together, we all work as a unit. And it shows us that with all together, we're able to uh, overcome a lot of troubles. And you know, thanks to them, I've learned so much. I've learned to work with younger people, I've learned to work with other older people, and it's just something that I'm very thankful for. I'm thankful for my teammates who helped me to overcome many problems. Thank you for my sponsor, my coach. Uh, who've helped me personally, who've helped me academically, and I don't think without them I would be where I am right now. I'd also like to thank um, um, my mom, my family, because she supported me through everything, and without her I don't think I'd be here either. Thank you.
Next item on our agenda is, is public comments. This is the time when the mayor and council would like to hear from anybody who would like to speak on any topic that's not a public hearing topic. And tonight we actually have no public hearing topic. So whatever you'd like to speak about, we ask that you keep your comments in no more than three minutes. When the, your time's down to 30 seconds, the timer will beep and turn yellow. When your time's up, it'll beep and turn red. We ask that you state your name and address or neighborhood for the record. Do we have any speakers this evening in public comments? Come on up. You could, you both can line up. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's first, just come right up, come right up, please. Hello, my name is Steve Rayfield. I live in Gaithersburg in the Wesley community. And uh, as I walked in the room today, I saw that uh, uh, these documents were posted for, for review. And uh, this is the first time I'm seeing it. I just got back from uh, uh, vacation. And uh, uh, I also see that on the second page, it says that you intend to have uh, a formal discussion of this on the 7th of January. Between now, with the date that this became available, which is uh, 12 17, the 7th of January, is a very, very short period of time. And it also includes Christmas and, and New Year's. Uh, I would like to see this review move to, to at least uh, early February to give people time to, to read it. Uh, it looks like a very interesting document, but it looks like it's also. Uh, quarter inch thick and uh, that extra time would be greatly appreciated thank you thank you uh, I think that agenda item is coming up later in this meeting and when our when uh, Dennis Enslinger our deputy city manager comes to lead us in it I think he's going to explain what the thinking was behind the timing I th in in general your points well taken please come on up How you doing, guys? All right. Dimo Christos, uh, Valley Square Road, Gaithersburg. Um, I'm a 37-year resident of, of Gaithersburg, 25 of them in the Kenlands. So, and I was also a chairman of the board uh, of the Kenlands uh, Citizens Assembly during the time when, when Market Square was getting off the ground and Lakelands was getting off the ground. And as you guys know, a lot of people got involved in that community, trying to get it off the ground, working with Ed Moore and, and other city council members to try to get everybody to come to the table at the same time. So we're investing in it emotionally as well as financially, and, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from on the, my next comments. We've had a, a beaver problem in, a, along the lakes. I know Neil's very much aware of it. And, um, and there has been a lot of consideration on what to do with removing the beaver, trans, you know, to relocate them and finding the time to do that when it best suits him being able to survive and the other beavers to be able to survive. I understand all that, and I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is the, the fact that trees were being destroyed while this was being talked about for over a month. And, and we finally, I think that, the, you know, there were pictures of this, uh, you know, being posted on, on next door. Uh, in late October, I think it took till December before the trees were wrapped. And in the meantime, the beavers took down quite a few what I call legacy trees. So the, the, where I get a little bit alarmed is when I think uh, Neil had posted on the 5th uh, an update from Kevin Rome and where he said that after much consideration, it has been determined that we will attempt to manage the beaver damage by protecting some of the trees and controlling pond water level with continued maintenance of the beaver dam as needed. The tree protection should begin next week. The part that bothers me is the last part. It's our hope to monitor the area through the winter, reevaluate the situation in the early, early spring if needed. And I asked for some clarification on that. I just want to understand, the beaver is going to be relocated, so I'm not sure what has to be reevaluated re other than the timing, unless there's some other different plan to make that some sort of wildlife sanctuary area. I just would like to hear that there it is going to be removed because I don't see a, a way that it coexists in a community like that. They're not, they not, he's knocked down a lot of big trees. I have lots of pictures. Um, and once he gets done, 
in the area around the trees, he will go up into the yards. And, and some of those lots, when we moved there, the, the, the Lakeview lots had a $50,000 premium on them. So they're considered, you know, prime, prime lots. So could I get some sense of, of, you know, maybe Tony can answer the question, are we removing the beaver, relocating the beaver? Thank yeah. you, Demo. I will. Yes, that is, yeah. Okay, that's all so I needed. I, 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 I Kevin, I'm, Kevin's wording I think is a little unfortunately vague, but the, the plan is absolutely in the spring <coughs> to relocate the beaver. That's all I wanted to hear. But you brought the, the topic up, um, and I was, during my report today, I mean, I did get some photos uh, from Public Works late today that the rain over the weekend actually caused the water to go up quite a bit higher than it normally does. Um, so right right now, it, it's manageable. Um, it was several truckloads of sticks and leaves and stuff that went up um, over the emergency spillway, uh, which, which is minor, but if we had gotten a major downpour, you know, we were concerned that we would have had to deploy um, people to, to manage that. And um, I want to thank Public issue. Works. They did a great job of yeah. wrapping. Finally, when they got to that, that's great. And I think it's working. And I'll send out the photos tomorrow. Um, but it, it is it's a more complex issue than, than just this single animal. And when you clog the spillway, it's, it's really difficult. And we're kind of trying to balancing that against the fact that it has no chance to survive until the spring. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely our, our plan in the spring to get those animal, animal or animals out of Lake Helene. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers this evening? Come on up. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address uh, you this evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Richard Rothrock. I'm the Manager of Government Affairs for Crown Castle here in Maryland. Uh, later this evening, you'll be reviewing amendments to the regulations for the installation of facilities and city rights of way. Uh, we appreciate the engagement and the hard work the staff has put forth in reworking these regulations. Uh, while the city's proposed changes to the regulations that are a step in the right direction, there are still a handful of lingering concerns. Uh, as such, I'd like to call your attention to the comment letter uh, that we submitted on December 4th of this year. In that letter, we outlined uh, our concerns related to those regulations as well as the template franchise agreement. There are two comments directly related to the regulations that I'd like uh, for you to discuss this evening. Uh, the first being the limitation on the placement of wireless facilities to certain roadways within the city. Uh, because Crown Castle's facilities must be located within proximity to the users, um, without modifying or making uh, changes to that uh, section of the regulations, we could in fact have uh, a situation where we would be looking at an effective prohibition. Uh, second, the requirement that base stations be placed a minimum of 500 feet apart. As with the previous comment, if not waived or modified, these requirements could have the result of effective prohibition. We understand you're here tonight to review the changes to the regulations, but we think it's important to understand that the full picture as it relates to the whole, at the deployment of the whole, as a whole, excuse me, and discussing these items along with concerns related to the franchise template will be another step forward in achieving a successful deployment. Thank you again for your time this evening, and we respectfully ask you to include these items in your discussion. Thank you. Any other speakers under public comments? Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you all for your comments. Um, <clears throat> we will get to the to small cell a little bit later in the meeting. We're going to move on to from the mayor and council. We're going to start with Council Member Spiegel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening again, everyone. Congratulations again to Council Vice President Wu. Um, it's been a busy couple of weeks. I'll just run very quickly through a number of events that <clears throat> several of us have attended, but. Um, in particular, a number of uh, Maryland Municipal League events. Um, on December 5th, um, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to participate in some uh, networking during the orientation program in Annapolis for all of the new state legislators, all of the newly elected state senators and delegates who were undergoing their orientation program. Uh, so it was a really good opportunity to get together with those folks, some of whom may come from districts where they don't have a lot of experience with municipalities, explain uh, what municipalities like Gaithersburg and many others around the state do, why we need the support of the state legislature on things like uh, funding of critical programs, uh, and uh, why we need their help to protect uh, home rule and local authority over certain 
types of issues that really traditionally have been and should continue to be uh, the purview of local government. And so it was a really good opportunity to just build relationships with those folks who we're going to have to be working with over the next four years and maybe beyond. Um, I've also been asked by the Municipal League to chair a committee to plan um, a municipal youth, uh, young municipal leaders uh, summit uh, sometime next year. So we've just started the planning for that event, which is really uh, geared towards um, uh, loosely defined uh, under 40 uh, uh, municipal officials, both elected and appointed officials who, who may uh, work in senior uh, positions for uh, municipal government. Uh, just to come together for a day of um, seminars, workshops, networking, uh, to provide a support system for a lot of those folks. Demographically, we've had more and more younger people uh, running for a municipal office and winning municipal office in recent years, and we think it'll be a good platform to build those relationships and connect them into not only the Maryland Municipal League, but also the National League of Cities, uh, the, sister the national sister organization of the MML. Um, which is uh, going to be co-sponsoring uh, that summit. So more to come on that. Um, also, um, last week, uh, many if not all of us attended uh, the annual Montgomery County Chapter uh, Legislative Dinner for the Maryland Municipal League. That's where just the municipalities from Montgomery County get together with our state delegation and have an opportunity to tell them about our priorities for the upcoming legislative session. Uh, that was also a really nice event, um, held for the first time in Rockville uh, in a while. It used to be in Bethesda. I'm glad it's a little closer to home now, and I'm glad it's actually in a municipality since that's the whole point of that that's event. The whole point. <laughs> uh, but that was a really good event, very festive, and a good opportunity to talk to our legislators again. So we're really making the rounds, trying to work on um, communicating our priorities to our state legislators as we gear up for the 2019 session starting in January. A couple other quick events I just want to mention. Um, I had the opportunity to attend a portion of the Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber of Commerce annual dinner. I know my colleagues uh, may have had the opportunity to spend a little bit more time there. I came a little bit late, uh, but that's always a wonderful event. And I want to thank our partners at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, who we continue to work closely with. Um, we welcomed a new restaurant to Washingtonian Rio Center uh, about a week ago. Uh, the Yard House is officially open. Uh, exciting new addition uh, with lakefront seating as the weather gets a little warmer um, and uh, encourage folks to check it out. Um, a number of us also attended the uh, Committee for Montgomery Annual Breakfast. Uh, this is an organization that brings together a very disparate swath of uh, groups from uh, business to labor, uh, chambers of commerce to government to educators to civic associations. Uh, to nonprofits um, and gets them all together in a, in a big room and talks about those priorities that really we can all get behind for Montgomery County. And so it's an important organization uh, with uh, good leverage and a good voice in Annapolis to advocate for Montgomery County priorities that people from all different corners of our county can get together and, get, and support. Um, so that was a nice event. Um, I also had the opportunity to be interviewed by a couple of uh, students in the Humanities Magnet Program at Roberto Clemente Middle School. And although Roberto Clemente is technically outside the city of Gaithersburg, it's in Germantown, uh, the students who interviewed me are Gaithersburg residents. And they're, they're doing a documentary film. Um, it, it's the, the theme of the film is uh, the nexus between diversity and the First Amendment in America. And so it's a really good opportunity to talk about both of those things from the perspective of somebody in Gaithersburg. Um, and uh, I wish them well. And um, hopefully when, we, when they get the final product done, maybe we'll be able to circulate it around the city um, and see the work that they've done. I, I understand that they're going to be entering their documentary film in a contest sponsored by C-SPAN, a national contest. So I uh, wish them uh, lots of luck. I uh, also want to give a shout out to our very creative staff and volunteers at the Gaithersburg Arts Barn. Um, on Friday night, uh, they hosted a 30th anniversary celebration of the greatest Christmas movie ever made, Die Hard, <laughs> uh, in conjunction with an ugly sweater party. Uh, and it was just really a lot of fun and just yet another example of the creative programming that our staff and volunteers are doing at the Arts Barn. Uh, we all are familiar with sort of the traditional theater performances and some of the other um, art classes, but um, to use that facility in, in other new ways is really great 
Uh, so I just want to um, give them kudos and, and encourage them to continue doing those kinds of things. Um, this past week, uh, the um, city staff and volunteers um, involved in the holiday giving program uh, did the distributions to families in need, and I just want to say thank you to everybody who was involved in that. Um, that's a really meaningful thing that we do here in the city, coordinated by our city staff, um, and it's just a sort of a special extra way to give back to those in need in our community. And thanks so much to everybody who did neighborhood uh, drives uh, to collect um, um, gift cards and other things to be able to donate to families in need. Um, and it's never too late, so even though the distribution for this year is done, they're always accepting um, additional donations to be able to use in, in, for future events and opportunities. Um, and then finally, I want to remind everybody that our, our Winter Lights uh, drive through program is still going through New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, the only night that it's closed is December 25th, um, so make sure you check it out this year. And um, make sure that you check out uh, lots of other ways to uh, help those in need um, in our community in this time of giving. And I wish everybody a very happy holidays. Thanks, Ryan. Neil. <coughs> Tough act to follow. Um, anyway, um, I was at an event earlier this evening where the, uh, the current class and recent classes of the Leadership Montgomery, which I'm in the current class along with my colleague, uh, the new vice, vice president, vice president of the council, Robert Wu, um, welcome the new members of the legislature as well as a number of new members and current members of the county council and others. Um, I was told that I managed to give my entire introduction in one breath, um, which is, um, Ryan, I think, did that whole thing in one breath, but he has better breath control than I do. Um, at any rate, uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, aside from the number of events that I attended as well as uh, my colleague, I want to mention a couple of additional ones. Uh, there was an event called Moving the Econo Economy Forward, which was focused on land use policies. And the guest speaker was uh, our newly elected county executive, uh, Mark Elrich, who had a number of strong few things to say about land use policy going forward. Um, it should be an interesting next four years to see where we go in terms of um, land use policy, in terms of making our uh, county more livable as we go forward. Um, attended the uh, luncheon, annual luncheon and awards from the um, Washington, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments at the uh, COG headquarters downtown, which included uh, members of the Transportation Planning Board, which I participate in, and our uh, uh, deputy city manager was there as well. Um, and at, at that event and one other event that I'll mention in a moment, um, I want to give a shout out to uh, State Delegate Mark Corman, who was given an award uh, based on his work for uh, to ensure uh, ongoing increased funding for a metro system, which is very mission critical to maintain that system in a, a, and improve the system's performance and maintainability going forward. Um, he also was given an award for the same basic subject at the Suburban Maryland Transportation Alliance uh, annual dinner as well. Um, so good work to Mark Corman. Uh, I think he's heard that from enough people, but I should mention it here as well. It was very important work on his part and the delegation and the governor and getting that going forward. Uh, took a lot of work to get Montgomery to get Maryland and Virginia and DC all aligned and making sure there was an additional $500 million a year for 10 years guaranteed additional funding for the metro system. Um, and finally, I'd like to mention another Leadership Montgomery event. You know, we have a, a special events once a month for the uh, current core class. This month was focused on economic development and we met a number of people who are involved in the uh, various county economic development organizations. Um, to me, the highlight of the day was a tour of a building in Silver Spring um, that is the headquarters of United Therapeutics. And I could go on and on, and I'll keep it short, but it's probably the most spectacular office building I've ever seen, and it's great to have it in the county. Um, really a landmark building with um, amazing technology. 100% uh, of its energy use is self-contained, so it, it contributes nothing to carbon emissions. Um, many, many innovative systems. If you ever have a chance to tour the building, I highly recommend it. It's really, really spectacular. Um, and I, uh, 
I also want to say that I uh, really had a great Hanukkah season. Got a chance to spend time with uh, my grown daughters and uh, my uh, younger daughter, Jess, made an amazing Hanukkah feast, including latkes, which was great, because usually I have to do that. And this way I didn't sc scrape my fingers while grating. Um, <laughs> anyway, it was a great holiday season, and I wish a very good Christmas, Hanukkah, Passover, no, not Passover yet. Happy New Year to whatever people are celebrating. I'm getting way ahead of the game. Yeah, really. Anyway, happy holidays, one and all. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Gloria. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Mayor. So I just want to uh, congratulate all of our new and returning residents who are volunteering their time and expertise on uh, our boards, committees, and commissions. Congratulations to uh, both of our high schools that uh, were recognized in the dance competition over the weekend um, and yes yeah, so um, it's been quite a busy month earlier this month uh, I had the pleasure of joining some of my colleagues and uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, Lourdes Padilla at Mana Food Center and we had a tour to talk about the uh, work that Mana Food Center does um, especially around the holidays and how much of a need there is for um, food in the county. Um, so please remember them as you're uh, thinking about your holiday shopping this year. Um, I also attended the uh, Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber of Commerce's uh, annual dinner celebration and award ceremony. They always hand out scholarships to our students at MC. Um, and this year they recognized two STEM students who are doing really amazing things. Um, one is uh, graduating this year and created an app to help students who are trying to figure out how to navigate um, registering for college and some other things. So kudos to those students. Um, the uh, 18th annual Minority Legislative Breakfast hosted by the uh, African American Chamber of Commerce the Asian American Political Alliance, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Montgomery County hosted their 18th annual breakfast earlier this month um, and it was attended by um, a lot of our elected officials, our new county executive, our senator, attorney general, um, and they uh, delivered their legislative agenda to um, the attendees. Um, the Maryland Municipal League of Montgomery County uh, Ryan mentioned we had our legislative <coughs> dinner and it was attended by our MML <coughs> president, uh, Mayor uh, Bridget Newton. Um, the executive director of the MML also came and uh, was really happy to see so many uh, of our colleagues around the county having a good time uh, as we prepare for a very busy legislative session. Um, so I had the pleasure of also participating in the uh, C-SPAN student cam documentary series. Um, I went to Roberto Clemente and was interviewed by two students and also um, Poolsville High School students, um, their communications program. They're also participating in the uh, documentary contest and wanted to know what it means to be an American. So I'm excited to see what uh, comes of this and hopefully it facilitates uh, a more in-depth conversation um, and this year I was able to volunteer with our city's holiday distribution every year we give out um, gifts and uh, food um, clothing items books for some of our neediest uh, residents and they're always so grateful for everything um, that we're able to collect throughout the year. So if you want to know more about that program, um, there's always a need. And I think they collect uh, these items year round. Shout out to our staff that volunteered um, over the two days with setting up, corralling um, the um, participants, um, the pictures uh, with Santa Claus. It was a great event. So I really appreciate our uh, community services division, Maureen and her staff, for pulling off this big event. And um, lastly, um, this coming Thursday, there's going to be a blood drive. If you want more information, uh, it's going to be at the Gaithersburg Library, 1-800 um, Red Cross um, is how you can learn more. And that's it. Oh, and happy holidays and happy new year since we won't see you guys for a couple of weeks. Thank you, Maria. Mike. 
Well, uh, before I begin, I'll, uh, I'll begin with an announcement. The Mayor and City Council are seeking to fill a vacancy on the Historic District Commission for one alternate position. The commission consists of five members and one alternate. It strives to ensure that historic resources within the city are preserved, recognizing the sense of place that they provide uh, is valuable and <laughs> recognizing the sense of place that they provide. It's a, va it's a great value to our current city residents, uh, key to attracting future city residents and integral to developing economic uh, uh, generating heritage tourism within the city. The Commission is responsible for determining Montgomery County Historic Preservation Tax Credit eligibility, reviewing historic area work permits, conducting courtesy reviews, and nominating potential resources for historic designation. Persons will be considered who have demonstrated special interest, uh, specific knowledge, or professional or academic training in fields such as history, architecture, historic preservation, architectural history, planning, archaeology, anthropology, curation, conservation, landscape architecture, urban design, or related disciplines. The Historic District Commission generally meets uh, monthly uh, on the fourth Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. here in City Hall. Resumes and letters of interest should be submitted by 5 p.m. on Friday, January 18, 2019 by a mail to Mayor and City Council, 31 South Summit Avenue, Gaithersburg, Maryland, 20877, or you can email cityhall at gaithersburgmd.gov. For more information, I encourage you to visit the city's website or contact planner Chris Berger at 240-805-1064. Sorry. Um, so just a couple items real quick. Uh, I don't want to repeat uh, what's, what's already been covered. Uh, one announcement I have is that I've, uh, recent, I was notified uh, this week uh, from, by the National League of Cities that uh, incoming president, our new president, Karen Freeman Wilson from Gary, Indiana, uh, has reappointed me to the National League of Cities Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee, uh, Policy and Advocacy Committee. It's a committee I've served on since 2007. I was vice chair of the committee and chaired it uh, before I was elected to the board of directors some year, a few years back. Uh, the committee is responsible for uh, helping to develop policy uh, and, uh, and positions and advocacy positions for the, the League of Cities related to the environment, conservation, energy, uh, and sustainability. So uh, I'm glad to be back working with that committee uh, and uh, look forward to uh, working with a new group. Uh, our uh, our new chair of that committee is Hattie Portis Jones, uh, council member uh, from Fairburn, Georgia. So, congratulations on that, and thanks for many years of, of good service in representing the city there. We appreciate it. Thanks. Um, I also attended the yard house uh, ribbon cutting. I think most of us were there. Uh, the The cool thing about, I mean, it's a beautiful new restaurant. Uh, has a great view of the lake. It's it's bright. It's airy. Um, there's 115 beers on tap if you haven't been there yet. They have a social hour that begins, they have a happy hour plus they have a social hour that begins at I think nine o'clock, so they have a late happy hour. Uh, but the cool thing about a, a new uh, restaurant like that is uh, the full-time employees that, that are engaged there. This yard house has 180 full-time employees, all in New Gaithersburg. So I wanna welcome the yard house um, and excited about a number of those employees who are going to live in the city and, and also work here. Uh, again, I want to thank our uh, uh, donors to the holiday giving program. Uh, I was able to participate in the Thanksgiving distribution, and I'm glad those who, who were able to attend the uh, distribution last weekend uh, uh, were able to uh, provide some comfort and aid to uh, our, our uh, vulnerable uh, and citizens in need. So. Um, the last thing I want to say is, uh, you know, it's uh, coming up. This is the time of year when we're really busy. We uh, last meeting we wished everybody happy Hanukkah. So tonight I'm going to wish you a happy solstice, happy Kwanzaa, happy Festivus, happy Christmas. <laughs> Most of all, I want to wish you all a joyous celebration with your friends and family, uh, and um, hopefully you'll be safe uh, and warm. Uh, and hopefully dry. I guess we have rain coming again. Um, 
uh, and a very happy new year. It's the last meeting of the year, so I'm looking forward to seeing you all in 2019. So I hope I hope you're all here in 2009. In, oh, thanks. Uh, at the next meeting. So <laughs> finally, congratulations to Rob. I guess you're. I I, I hope you're ready to for the strenuous and arduous uh, tenure of uh, <laughs> vice president. Uh, yeah, uh, but you know, we've uh, made Judd promise that he will never be absent for the entire year, so <laughs> so we have no concerns about uh, the need to uh, call on you. Uh, all, right. <laughs> all right, thank you, Mike. Uh, Council Vice Pro President Wu. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and, and thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you to my colleagues um, on the vote of confidence uh, here today. I'm very happy now to actually move towards the top of the letterhead. Uh, after <laughs> traditionally finding myself all the way at the bottom. Um, but I, I just wanted to note that, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. We all have our opinions. Uh, we all do great work for the city. And at the end of the day, I think what, what sets us apart from perhaps other governing bodies in the area is, is our collegiality and our willingness to work towards a common goal for the good of our residents and for the good of the city. So thank you. Um, I'd also in particular like to thank Ryan Spiegel, uh, my colleague, uh, for his hard work in this uh, past year as the council vice president. I believe he had to pick up the gavel once, maybe twice. Um, but also in, in general, all the hard work that Ryan has been putting um, in. And, and, and I'll, I'll give him this, don't, go to, don't let this go to your head, but mentoring credit. Um, of, 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 of all the folks on the council, I'll reach out to him most, and Judd as well. Um, and in one of those instances I'd like to highlight is with respect to him encouraging me to join the, the MML Hometown Emergency Preparedness Ad Hoc Committee, which met this past weekend. Um, they're doing a, a lot of uh, interesting and important work. Um, a, a focus of ours right now is on the opioid crisis here in Maryland and figuring out strategies as to how municipal officials can engage um, to, to better address that um, serious issue here in our communities. I'm looking forward to working there on the committee uh, in the future as well. I um, wanted to thank and congratulate uh, all the reappointees and appointees to the committees, including Ms. Dixon here, who's here today. Um, you know, as we, I think we stress each and every meeting, you know, there's a great ways to engage the city. The committees are, are one way to do that, and we really need folks to step up and get involved in their communities. So thank you all, and particularly Ms. Dixon, who showed up here today, for, for stepping up to become uh, members of these committees. Um, various meetings, and you know, it is tis the season to attend uh, things, and so a, a lot of the meetings have been uh, mentioned. I, I will mention, uh, like my colleagues, I was interviewed by certain Poolsville High School students, the C-SPAN competition. I, I, I find it interesting um, that, that, that Gaithersburg is being recognized and Gaithersburg leaders are being recognized for leading a city of such great diversity that's becoming interest, not only to students that are inside Gaithersburg, which we're happy to help as well, but also students who are coming from all over the county who want to engage us to talk about something that we're really proud of, which is our diversity here in our community. Um, I, I was at the Council of Governments annual meeting with Dennis and Neil. Um, I was sitting, actually sitting next to Neil. Maybe he didn't look in my direction. Uh, but it was a great dinner or a great lunch. <laughs> and I would like to point out Some one thing. Um, I, I sit on the Council of Governments uh, Board of Governors. And at this past meeting was also a business meeting. And at the business meeting, we elected um, the new leadership. Mm -hmm. And one of the new leaders is um, Kate Stewart, the mayor of Tacoma Park who was elected to be the secretary of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And that, that, that is a, a quite an achievement okay. and quite a recognition of our, yeah. our local municipal mm -hmm. officials um, um, taking part in this, this regional activity. Um, and I guess last but not least, happy holidays. And uh, stay safe out there. Happy New Year. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm not going to. I'm just going to echo everything everybody said. They got to. I, I was at all these events, and I and I thank all the same people. So why rehash it? Um, <laughs> it didn't stop anyone else. Well, that's true. Um, Want to wish everybody uh, happy everything, and um, and all of our to all of our Gaithersburg family a fantastic 2019. This is this right here is the last public meeting we have of the of the year we will not have work sessions on the 24th or the 31st due to the holidays the next regular session of the mayor and council will be 
held on Monday, January 7th, 2019, right here, 7.30 p.m. at City Hall. We will move on to from the city manager. Thanks, Mayor. A few items. Um, starting with recycling, um, as, as several of you have reported, uh, vendor performance by a recycling contractor has been a little spotty the last few months. Um, Mike Johnson from Public Works has uh, responded by engaging the, the vendor contractor. It's not someone that you could swap out really easily, so we're hoping to, to work things out to improve performance, but we are dedicating a staff member to, um, to uh, let's follow them around, but certainly monitor the performance a little more closely um, because um, as, as several of you have pointed out, some, sometimes they miss entire blocks versus just individual homes, which is you know understandable when one recycling bin looks much like another, but um, we're, we're hoping to improve that performance prior to um, the next go round of the of the contract. Um, <clears throat> more globally, I think I've expressed before that that recycling itself is, is going through some growing pains. Um, Mike Johnson has also proposed um, enrollment in a program at uh, Rutgers University um, called Recycling Certification Series, just so that we can get just get a better understanding of what's going on uh, in the in recycling business here in the United States and, and on all the countries that, frankly, a lot of the recycled materials get exported to. So that seemed like a good idea, and he's going to start that um, next year. Uh, also, on a public works note. Um, in January, you'll be getting a, a presentation um, on the potential to remake the side of the crosswalks here in Old Town and possibly some of the lighting. Um, there was a fatal accident in Old Town in November that was attributed to excessive speed, um, but <clears throat> it, it was an occasion to, to kind of accelerate our look at the crosswalks. The decorative crosswalks just don't jump out at you um, like the striped ones do. Um, so uh, uh, Mike Johnson again will be coming and making a presentation about some things that, that we may want to consider here in Old Town. Um, many, many thanks from the employees. Um, the, uh, as a reminder that we will be closed here at City Hall and all city facilities both on December 25th and December 24th. And they express their appreciation to Mayor and Council for, for trying that. Uh, we've never done that before. But we, we'll try it this year and see, see how it works out. Well, your generosity deserves the big credit here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just for the record, you know, this was Tony's idea. He brought it to us. We we agreed to it, but it was Tony's idea. Well, so. several municipalities are are doing it around. Yeah, or in the region. So yeah, so I can't claim that it's just my idea. right. But but it was certainly oh, warmly not? received <laughs> by the by yes. the employee. Um, okay, thank you, Tony. We'll move on to economic development update. Tom Lonergan. Thank you, Mayor. I can confirm it was warmly received. Uh, two quick items from me tonight, uh, kind of late breaking, just wanted to mention that at the end of the day today, Governor Hogan announced that Kelly Schultz is his nominee to be the new secretary for the Maryland Department of Commerce, formerly DBED, Department of Business and Economic Development. Um, Kelly Schultz currently serves as the Secretary of the Department of Labor, Licensing and Regulation, or Dollar as we call it. Uh, Mike Gill, who had served in, as Secretary since 2015, is returning to the private sector. Uh, staff here in Gaithersburg had a very good working <coughs> relationship with Mike Gill for many years. You may recall he came to the city uh, immediately upon taking the job, and over the years we had a good working relationship. Uh, we look forward to building new bonds with uh, Secretary Schultz, and, and we will be inviting her to an upcoming meeting to meet with all of you as well. Secondly, and finally, I wanted to mention that completion of the Park Plaza here in Old Town earlier this year <clears throat> was obviously a major milestone for the city. Uh, it, but wouldn't it have been nice, asked Councilman Spiegel, among others, if patrons could also access free Wi-Fi while lounging in our Adirondack chairs? Well, as of Friday, they can. Past Friday, they could, rather. Uh, late last week, city staff completed the installation of the access point antenna hardware required to provide this amenity. Uh, network public uh, COG, City of Gaithersburg. Network uh, password is Tree City. I'd like to thank all of our IT staff for getting that job done. And uh, it's now ready and available for Mark commuters now, and I guess Park Plaza visitors come spring. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to move on to ordinances, resolutions, and regulations. And Lynn Board is going to lead us in discussion on the development agreement for 315 East Diamond. 
Thank you. Uh, what's before you this evening is a resolution to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute a development agreement for the property located at 315 East Diamond. Um, as a reminder, back in September of 19, or excuse me, 19, that was way too long, 2016, <laughs> um, we entered into a purchase agreement with A&W Gaithersburg LLC to develop what's known as the Fishman property, but 315 East Diamond Avenue. It's part of that development agreement because the project was fairly new. Uh, it deferred some of the, the more detailed discussion of some of the aspects of that project to a development agreement. Uh, the developer has been working his way through the or through their way through the planning process. Um, they do have um, final site plan approval from the planning commission. It is contingent on a number of conditions that are still being worked through uh, with the staff. Um, but since we do have those um, a little bit more detail, the uh, specifically the purchase agreement. Uh, wanted more detail dealing with what was going to happen with the bud car and then also we wanted to ensure connectivity between uh, that property and the, the park plaza that Tom just talked about. Uh, so staff has certainly been meeting with the developer and working through. Uh, we have the development agreement before you this evening and there are um, several key terms in the development agreement that I want to briefly discuss. Uh, the first deals with the bud car and um, we have outlined two different options uh, for the bud car. Um, the first would be to relocate the bud car to the city-owned property by the community museum. Um, there are some proposed plans that the city has developed that were part of the packet. The estimated cost of implementing those plans is $170,000. Uh, what we're proposing in the agreement is that uh, the developer would actually do the work and the city would pay to the developer $70,000. So then the developer's contribution towards that project would be $100,000. Um, the, the second option is just to have the developer remove and dispose of the bud car. Um, and if the city would choose that option, the developer would pay to the city uh, the amount of $50,000. Um, and we have slated that the mayor and council would make a decision on, on which option to choose by March 15th of 2019. I think Tony may provide a little bit more detail as to sort of what they're thinking. We, um we, as I mentioned a number of meetings ago, staff is going to work on a, a memo to you out, outlining both uh, points of view. Uh, Parks clearly has one, and economic development and, and financial aid is, is another. Um, and also the maintenance of the view shed of the museum is, is kind of a wild card issue there. Um, so we will be sending that out to you for to get your feedback before the March deadline. Great. Um, some of the other issues um, certainly are the integration of uh, the, the new building on 315 to the Park Plaza. Uh, we have primarily deferred that to the site plan process because the Planning Commission has spent quite a bit of time and staff has uh, to ensure that that's seamless and that there's pedestrian access to, uh, to you know, go, certainly go back and forth between those properties. Um, we've also agreed to have the project to be constructed in accordance with Green Globe standards to ensure that there's um, uh, that the, the building is uh, a, an efficient uh, building. So that was one of the, the issues that we've agreed to. We also, and I guess sort of as a, also a follow-up to Tom's comment about the Wi-Fi and Park Plaza, the developer has agreed to allow the city to install public safety cameras as well as an antenna um, on the building so it will uh, allow the city to have better access to its public safety systems. Um, and finally, uh, we did ensure that the first floor of the building would be constructed in such a way to entice uh, retail commercial uses on the first floor. Uh, we, we did include certain provisions to ensure that it was conducive to that use. And then there's also a requirement for marketing uh, those uses on the property as well. Uh, so happy to answer any questions you have, um, but staff is looking for the, the council to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute the agreement. Thank you, Lynn. Questions, comments, who wants to? Who has them? So Mike. I guess my uh, the first concern or question I have is about the uh, the, the space, the retail space mm -hmm. on the first floor, whether it will have both front and rear entry to ensure that uh, whoever occupies those spaces will be able to load and unload yeah. without uh, blocking the street uh, or and to remove trash or whatever else from the, that location. That seems to be, that's certainly a problem that we're aware of with other other sites in the city. 
Yeah, one we did specifically include language in there that there would be um, that the construction would have rough ends of mechanicals, provision of adequate loading, and ventilating of mechanical equipment. Um, and as we've gone through the planning commission process, you know that's certainly something that the planning commission has has looked at to ensure that the viability of that space for mm -hmm. retail use. Okay. Uh, and then the other question I had is, um, or not a question, but I guess it's a, it's really a comment about the the bud car. I don't remember how much we paid for that, uh, but <clears throat> we uh, we effectively we traded it for it. Traded, traded it, right? Traded. Okay. Right. Um, anyway, uh, you know, to lose one of those pieces, I, I think our train museum and community museum has become a, a destination for people. For fans of trains and other stuff, especially the uh, council member Wu here, vice president of the council, Wu, uh, and his children. Uh, my my uh, grandchildren certainly. Well, at least my granddaughter really thinks trains are cool too. So, um, you know, I think uh, anything we can do to maintain that those uh, uh, those pieces is pretty important to you know the the uh, integrity of the of the collection that we have and, and how it fits into the, the heritage of uh, Gaithersburg as being a train stop, so a train station as well. So that's, I'm just, I am reluctant to vote for something that, that allows the option that uh, the train, would, that a, one of the cars would be removed. So anyway, uh, that's just a concern. Can I ask a question about the butt car financial deal? The second piece that you mentioned where they could they have the option, we could a ask them to dispose of the butt car, they'd pay us $50,000. Mm -hmm. Who would actually pay for the disposal at that point? The developer would. Okay, yeah. so that's, that they would pay the cost of the disposal plus, plus $50,000. Correct. So do we have, in my understanding of the butt car, uh, is, of the butt car's current condition is that it would require a significant amount of work to bring it up to the point where it was actually usable uh, in terms of rainproof and things like that. Do we have any idea what the magnitude of, the, of that work might be? I guess say Dennis may be the better person to answer that <laughs> question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm prepared at this point to answer that question. That would be something that would be contained in the memo. We have had issues. Um, again, you have to realize that the train car was meant to move, and so it's built out of stainless steel and aluminum, and so when that contracts and expands we have leakage issues within the bud car itself that's been our primary issue with that mm -hmm. we've had it sealed fairly well but once we move it we know we are going to have the same issue again and it's always difficult to get that seal just right so there will be additional costs related to that mm -hmm. in addition it hasn't really been outfitted in any form or fashion so uh, park recreation and culture has talked about doing some additional improvements with that and that will also be covered by the memo Okay, so yeah. at this point, we just don't know what that cost. We know what the cost from the developer's point of view would be, but we don't know what the cost would be should we decide to maintain that uh, in usable condition, right? Correct. Okay. And, and again, the development agreement gives us the option. It doesn't give the developer the option. Right. We get to choose whether we keep it or uh, dispose of the bud car. So you know uh, some order of magnitude of how much money we've already spent on improving and maintaining yeah. it? A significant amount um, before I actually got here, um, considering it's been reconstructed internally with uh, some new electrical and some other things. It was in pretty poor condition when we received it, so a lot of it's been reconstructed at some point. So I don't know the magnitude. Can you include of, that number in the memo as well? We'll include the previous costs. Yeah. Um, I got picked that up from Mike, so we'll include the previous costs, what we anticipate the additional costs once we move it would be. Um, and then Park and Rec and Culture will talk about how they use that facility. Again, one of the other primary concerns that uh, we have as staff is really kind of the visibility of the train, not necessarily train station, but the, the depot where the museum is mm -hmm. will be significantly blocked by moving um, the bud car in front of it because um, we're actually relocating the bud car where the caboose is and then the caboose will go in front of the bud car. So there'll be limited visibility of actually uh, the museum itself from any frontage. Okay. All right, food for thought. That that doesn't have to be resolved in this particular yeah. at this point, but it's come. It will be coming. Okay. Yeah. And go ahead. Of course, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll consider all information put in front of me for um, rendering a vote. But I, I will point out that my family derives significant uh, 
enjoyment and others in the area derive significant enjoyment from the train museum. It's unique in, in the area. But again, I'll consider anything that comes before me. But we should keep the bug car. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I read through the agreement here. It, it, it's, a, it's a good agreement. It puts a lot of, of um, discretion in the hands of the, the, the city and a lot of with respect to the development of the, the structure, I do appreciate the fact that the agreement includes um, certain provisions and safeguards that I think uh, address um, past issues with other projects in the area. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that, that it, it, it's, it's the, the, the terms of the agreement, I think, are, are well drafted. Okay, would someone like to move the resolution? So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, carries 5 0. Thank you, Lynn. And next, uh, we're going to talk about small cell. We're going to invite uh, yes. Dennis <coughs> Enslinger, our deputy city manager, and Frank Johnson, our uh, assistant city attorney, to lead us in this presentation. What's before us tonight is, is an introduction. Um, we will be um, voting on whether to introduce and move forward, but um, should we move forward then? Well, I'll let you guys explain it, explain the process. This is a little different from the usual process because I think there's some, we're working against some FCC imposed time timelines. Yes, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, as the Mayor pointed out, Frank and I are here to kind of talk about revisions to city's right-of-way regulations more specifically related to the small cell facilities we did make a few other changes um, just to give you a little bit of background on the right-of-way regulations uh, we began writing right-of-way regulations in 2016 uh, for those of you who were participants we had a number of extensive uh, public meetings regarding these regulations and on December 18th uh, 2017 the mayor and council adopted regulations that you find before you um, tonight. In addition, uh, we adopted some template franchise and master license agreements that related more specifically to the small cell issue also. And even when we did the approval back in uh, 2017, we did note that as technology changes or there are additional FCC regulations, we would be coming back before uh, the mayor and council to make revisions as appropriate. And again, I'll just kind of for the public standpoint, um, we often uh, reference the regulations and they're basically regulation 0217. Um, they not only establish small cell regulations within the right-of-way, but really all construction and use of the right-of-way for all users. Um, we specifically called out uh, two sections that related to wireless facilities um, within the regulations just because it's a lot more complicated issue than some of the other users within the right-of-way. Um, the city and the industry have been working together um, over the past uh, four to five months, uh, Crown Castle and AT&T, in developing some of the proposed changes uh, that you see before you um, tonight. In terms of revisions, there are minor revisions related to Section 1, um, which is really the regulations applicable to all applicants for use of the right-of-way, and Section 2, which are additional regulations applicable to work in the right-of-way. And then there are a lot more focus modifications related to Sections 3 and 4, which are specifically related to the wireless facility um, aspects, those that are on um, kind of industry poles or utility poles, and those are actually that are on our own uh, facilities, whether that be a controlled traffic signal or street light. I will point out that the proposed uh, modifications do not change the current regulations with regard to placement, spacing, and height of wireless uh, facilities in the right-of-way. I know that was a lot of discussion previously. Uh, Crown Castle and both AT&T have also voiced concerns about not having any modifications to those uh, sections of right-of-way. Um, since we approved the regulations back in 2017, there's actually been a recent FCC ruling um, which kind of further outline and actually restricts how the city can regulate um, these types of facilities within our right-of-way. Um, that 
grilling was to be in place on January 14th of 2019. Um, there's a slight modification to that. Um, just this past Monday, uh, the FCC um, was asked to stay the regulations to give cities a little bit more time to gain a better understanding of the proposed uh, regulations under the FCC order. They kind of bifurcated um, the original FCC order. So anything that relates back to uh, kind of the shot clocks, um, the fees um, will become effective on January 14th. Uh, but then anything that deals with the aesthetic concerns, they've granted another 90-day um, extension. And so those would not be needed to be in place until April 15th of 2019. Um, so we've had a little bit of change since this presentation has been put together, and I'll note that in the public hearing process portion um, at the very end of the meeting and give you the council some options. But just to be clear, Dennis, part of our thinking in moving forward with this sort of so quickly from this point is because of the effective date of the FCC <coughs> regulation. Yes, and I think um, we're comfortable making some changes to the proposed timeline based upon that bifurcation of the original FCC order uh, because they've actually given another 90 days on certain sections. And I'll kind of cover that at the very end and give council some options uh, with regard to that since we've already received some public feedback on that. So to really go over the modifications, um, I'm going to start with kind of the midwire connections and also just the other equipment. Uh, the midwire connections under the current regulations allowed for uh, two cubic feet. Uh, the proposed modifications expand that maximum to 2.5 cubic feet. I will note that this particular um, installation, the midwire connections, do not require a permit from the city. They're basically granted and they need to be notified uh, of us when they actually go up, but there's no formal permitting process on that particular aspect. The antennas, um, the height of the antenna, there's been no change to the proposed maximum height of four feet. There have been changes to the connectors um, that connect the antenna to the utility pole. Uh, the current regulations uh, limit the connector to six inches. Um, the proposed modification expands that link to 12 inches. In addition, in terms of the overall antenna, um, the diameter and location of the antenna have changed slightly. The current regulations limited the antenna to the smallest circumference of the pole. Um, we've worked with industry standard to look at what they're currently installing and have proposed the modification that expands it to a maximum of 22 inches in circumference. And in this particular example, I will note it is for either three, three carriers, so it's not just one carrier using that antenna. Um, I should also note that when we talk about these things, I think it's clear to understand that what we're talking about today in terms of size and equipment are really for 4G installations. None of these um, proposed modifications or equipment are actually dealing with anything that's related to the 5G, uh, just so we kind of set that record straight for the public. In addition, because we've increased the maximum size uh, circumference for the antenna, we used to allow some side um, mounting of the antennas, but we are restricting um, the mounting to the um, on top of the pole for all the installations. In our regulations, we kind of have a sub-size equipment housing. Um, the current regulations are basically maximum height of 36 inches, width of 12 inches, and a depth of 9 inches, and with a volume of no greater than 2.25 uh, cubic feet. The proposed modification still leaves that in place, but allows the city to approve modifications um, to height, width, and depth, as long as the two point, or, sorry, we've changed it to 2.5 cubic feet, so, but we are also allowed to change additional modifications to the height and width. Um, that was at the industry request. Standard equipment housing is kind of divided into a couple components. Uh, the current uh, regulations call for 2.8 cubic feet, uh, the proposed modification increases the maximum volume to 12 cubic feet. So it's a pretty significant change in overall size. There are also a number of regulations that re with regard to the height and width and depth. Um, for the current regulations, it's currently limited a maximum of 12 inches for height, 9 inches for depth, um, and then there was no maximum width um, requirement. 
proposed modifications basically kind of tie the maximum height to the overall maximum width, and then they're nine inches in depth. And again, these are to help um, the industry kind of do some installations based upon what they are seeing uh, within the field itself. Um, there are also provisions to allow for modification of the height and width as long as the maximum cubic feet is maintained. And here's an example of a Crown Castle um, product that they would be installing. I will note that it maintains the 12 cubic feet, but they are requesting changes um, within the dimensions um, than we currently have listed in the regulations. There's also ground-mounted equipment. Um, current regulations allow for maximum dimensions of 50 inches by 32 by 12. What we're proposing is to try to simplify that by basically saying it's a maximum cubic feet at 16 with a height no greater than 44 inches. And here's an example of what might be installed, um, what everybody calls kind of the mailbox um, ground-mounted equipment. Any evidence of folks trying to mail things? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's similar to the other green ones, which the you know the post office used to have as transfer stations. If you've ever seen them, you know the blue ones are the ones you can mail in, but the green ones were actually where they have somebody come in and put the mail, and then another postman come to pick it up. So. Hmm. Let's hope the post office doesn't get confused. <laughs> yeah. um, we've also made significant changes to the paint specifications. There, originally, there were about 19 different specifications. We have really simplified that down to four, uh, and they're really general qualities. Uh, we've also modified uh, the pole reservation system. Uh, currently, there was a pole reservation system which allowed um, different users to place a hold on the pole for a period of time before the actual facility was installed. We've eliminated that pole reservation system and basically it's now based upon a specific application. And if there are multiple applications for a pole, the city gets to determine which applicant to move forward with in the process. Um, so there'll be no kind of holding of it, poles without equipment on it. You actually have to apply for an application and that needs to be in place and approved before we would move forward with that. How do you address later comers to the Later process? comers would have to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis, whether there's a, another poll within a parameter that works for them, uh, but that's the gist of it. We, you know, we don't know when they're going to come in, um, so it's really going to be a first-come, first-served basis. Part of that has to do with the FCC regulations and how it works um, from their perspective. I will note we will be bringing a couple of minor additional changes back to you related to the poll reservation system. Um, in kind of the cross-check of sections that impact each other. Uh, we missed in section four, there's a section ZZ, uh, one and two, that we need to make some small uh, minor modifications that still reference the pole uh, reservation system. And now um, Crown Castle was um, kind enough to provide some examples of the existing uh, equipment that we've been discussing tonight and the implications of how they would be installed. Uh, this is basically on a uh, utility pole that is not owned by the city. That's before Pepco knocks down all the branches, right? <laughs> um, none one, of these are One in. thing at a time. So can you go <laughs> back to that photo there, please? Um, so there are two devices on this pole, correct? There's a box on the there, and then there's the antenna, antenna at the top. top. It's one facility, okay. but it's right. all connected. Right. In addition, um, there will be an electrical meter, too, for each of these facilities, which okay. is usually a third, but that's one of the issues is that PEPCO requires it not to be contained within a pole, or in a, so they're requiring it to be outside of the pole. We haven't gotten them to um, concur with placing the meter in the pole at this point. Is that included within the dimensions of the... It is not. It's a separate... So item. it's a separate element as well. What's nice. Uh, so it won't look too cluttered, will it? Um, as I, best I'm being as sarcastic. We, yeah. As best as we can make it. Uh, yeah. We have in yeah. our regulations um, preference for an in-pole mounting. Uh, clearly on a wood-based pole, you'll never get that. But on some of our poles, we could get that. Um, so that's still in the regulation. That's our preference. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of trying to get Pepto, Pepco to approve a meter that could fit inside um, a pole. We haven't gotten them to get to that point yet. But what is their objection? Have they explained it? Um, for them, it's really about um, accessing the meter. 
um, and also reading the meter, which we're not really sure why that's a difficulty because most of them are not. But really they were read. reading them. They're all electronic. <laughs> electronic <laughs> wireless. But I think the primary thing is accessing the meter because in theory they are supposed to be able to access the meter, and if it's inside the pole, it's difficult to do that. So would there be any instances where Petco would have an installation on a pole for its own use? And if so, what happens when the wireless wants to install on the pole and they have to have facilities as well? Pepco can have their own facilities on their own poles, and so we would they would have to work that out with them. Again, we don't get in between Pepco and, and them. Uh, they would have to have approval to be on a Pepco pole. That's one of the conditions um, of so, them So going you could on. have instances where you have two boxes sitting It's on possible. As you can see, pole. there are actually some additional cable boxes um, here and here. Those are mid-wire boxes. Can you can actually see on the yeah, monitor? Okay. You go ahead. Do that one yeah, that's right. So this is yeah. kind of a mid-wire cable box connection, and this is also a mid-wire cable box. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a hierarchy, so I'm not really sure why these aren't in the same location. But. Do, do the regulations address the situation and whether or not the safety concerns would be addressed in the installation of more than one facility on a wooden pole? There's always the, the aspect that they have to show that it's structurally sound um, to add the additional equipment. So this is just one cell, cell antenna. This is actually for multiple providers. Um, this would, I believe, under Crown Castle's example, would be up to three providers. Okay. Um, but, but one antenna node for yes. each of those three <coughs> providers. Contained within that self um, unit. Oh, it's okay within it. Okay. And it's 4G here. Um, yes, this that's This is 5G. We don't, 5G doesn't actually exist, I think, right? Not at yeah. this point. Yeah. Here's an example on kind of a city-owned or another public utility pole, depending on whether it's owned by the city or not. This is a Cobra Head um, in Baltimore. Um, so you can see the box down here. Um, you can see the antenna and the connector. This is a little bit clearer in terms of the connector. You can also um, kind of make out uh, the electrical meter right there down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it's got the box on it as well. So. Um, are our poles um, as as installed now? Are they able to to manage this um, additional weight? It, it's like very unlikely on our poles, yeah. partly because we also may not have enough information to determine whether the base of the pole is sufficient to yeah. carry the additional weight. So it's more than likely in our cases they're going to at least replace the the footing. Or the base of the pole and probably the pole itself. They being crown cast. Um, yes, whoever the provider is. In this photograph, is the um, is the pole a pre-existing pole or is it all completely replaced to look like a pre-existing? I believe pole? in this particular case, it's an existing pole. Okay. It's pretty tall for an existing light pole. It looks like it's. It, it could have been squashed, but it's probably 25 feet. 30 yeah, it feet. looks like it's 25 or 30. And again. Um, we do have poles as height. We don't have a lot of cobra heads. Um, we have a lot more decorative poles. So if you go down to Washington Boulevard or somewhere like that, we have a lot more shoebox type. But they are about 25. Um, some are a little bit greater than that. Let's say along Quince Orchard Boulevard, we have a lot of. We, those are all yes. city poles, those, right? So Quince Orchard Boulevard. Quince Orchard Boulevard. Yes. They're all city poles in First Field. The right of way for Quince Orchard Road is actually um, the state. The state. No, but I'm talking about our roads are first we, field and yeah. sort of We do have a few, but we tend to have more decorative than Cobra Head lights. Okay. This is a, an example where there is no light. Um, so this was a new pole that was constructed. Uh, within the right of way, it's basically the same configuration um, and the equipment. And you can probably make out better down here the two additional boxes, which is one is the meter and the other one is actually the cutoff. I mean, relative to the size of the car underneath that, next to the pole, that box looks pretty big. It is not a small box, right? Yeah. I'll have to disagree with you. Um, here's a before example in Baltimore and what was a proposed. Um, so this is with the ground mounted equipment of the mailbox along with a shorter pole. Um, so again, you can see in this particular case, all the equipment, ground-mounted equipment, is located in that box. So do you usually need both? Would you need it side by side? You One would need them in close proximity if you're going to use this scenario. 
um, where the, the equipment's ground mounted. Mm. Um, so really the next steps for this particular introduction is for the mayor and city council to determine if it would like to hold a public hearing on the proposed modifications. Just to refresh everybody's memory, we actually have, you have the ability under um, or, uh, the ordinance provisions to either not do a public hearing for regulations or to actually do a public hearing. Previously for these particular regulations because of the impact, um, you did establish a public hearing uh, for the previous regulations and we went through that process. Based on that, staff was proposing to um, hold a public hearing um, on January 7th. We initially, before the um, additional information from the FCC proposed closing of the public record on January 8th. That would have been a pretty quick timeline or turnaround, but again, part of that related back to the January 14th deadline of the FCC. Um, we do have some options with regard to that. We would still like to keep the public hearing on uh, January 7th, but allow a longer time period uh, for public comment. And so what we would propose, there are a couple dates, is um, and originally we we're going to bring it back on the 22nd for final adoption we would propose bringing it back for adoption of the regulations and approval of the template franchise and master license agreements either on february 4th or february 19th and based upon those two dates so the february 4th um, deadline would necessitate us having public comment back by january 21st and the February 19th um, final deliberation would allow us to extend it to February 4th. So those are really kind of the two options. We, you know, either one is fine with staff, depending on what council would like to allow for additional public comment after the public hearing. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dennis. Uh, I think it does make sense to to hold a public hearing, even though it's it's not legally required that we do. I think it makes sense. Um, Lynn, I was, I want to put you on the spot here for a second. Um, we had, um, uh, in public comment earlier and on, in the, uh, memo that's in the, that's been submitted to the record, um, a question about some of our regulations being effective, working out to make effective prohibitions. Do you want to address that at all? Sure. But I, I think some of the, the difficulty here is because of the FCC order, which they adopted that on Feb, or excuse me, on September 26. Uh, it's slated to go into effect January 14th. Um, it did in that order, uh, the FCC provided a, an interpretation of what effective prohibition means. Um, however, as the council is aware that that order is under appeal, uh, there was an additional appeal that was actually filed today, which the city was a party in the D.C. Circuit Court, and, a mo and another motion to stay that was filed with that court. Um, however, we do not know at this point whether a motion to stay will be granted before the, the January 14th date. Um, the one thing that the FCC did Could, when... Can I stop you just for, yeah. just mm -hmm. for a sec? And just to give anybody watching uh, just a, a quick little primer on why we can't... why it's not in our best interest to... Uh, create a regulation that would be an effective prohibition. Yeah, yeah. Under um, e even under existing law before the FCC September order, um, the the FCC had in prior orders and the courts had have, um, had agreed that we cannot provide an effective prohibition of cellular service of these types of facilities. Um, the various circuit courts around the country had different interpretations of what effective prohibition meant. So in the more current order, the FCC provided their interpretation, uh, which like most legislation is still very probably subject to further interpretation of what it actually means in, in practicality. Um, under, regardless of what happens with the FCC, I mean, I think staff has always believed that uh, the, the two issues that were mentioned earlier uh, this evening, the road classification and the 500-foot separation issue, do not create effective prohibition under the city's regulations because we have included what we call safe 
harbor provisions where there is the ability for uh, the industry to come in and request a waiver. Um, so they would have to come in and request a waiver saying that this would be effective prohibition because in this particular circumstance, you know, there's no other way to provide service or, you know, they would have to provide some justification for that waiver. It is an additional step for them, but we do believe that that um, keeps us in a position where we are not creating effective prohibition because, again, if they can come in and justify as to, you know, why they would need the waiver, uh, then that would be something that the city would consider and the city would grant. So, I mean, that was something that we looked at when we initially adopted the regulations to ensure that there was that, you know, ability to have that safe harbor so we would not be creating an effective prohibition. I have a question. Sure. So, the location of equipment is not something that we're changing or looking to modify at this step. It wasn't anything that was part of the changes in the presentation or in the document that I could see. So why is it coming up? I mean, Crown Castle both sent us a letter from their attorney and brought it up in comments earlier. Why now are they bringing up the effective prohibition if that's not what we're considering at this point? Well, I mean, I think that that's a comment, to, in, in fairness to Crown Castle, I think that that was a comment that they had when we adopted the regulations initially as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, that they potentially legally interpret effective prohibition more stringently than, than the city sees that language. Okay. So, uh, so while we're on the topic, and mm -hmm. I, I want to ask a question as well, because my reaction to the uh, first two concerns in Crown Castle's letter in the record was the same, is that we have this uh, exception process where if, if an applicant can come in and say, all right, here's the, here's the reason why we need to get a, a variance or an exception from the other standards about you know where these facilities can go or how close they can be, and if they can demonstrate you know, the need outside of the standard rules and the reg that are in our regulations now, then they would have the option to possibly get an exception from those rules, and that sort of takes care of the concern that, that the rules effectively prohibit that. I think that's what you're saying. Um, their, their response to me when I was talking with them about this is that, well, our regulations don't really lay out what the process is for going ahead and requesting an exception or a variance and what the standards would be in a hearing before the mayor and council. But I mean, I guess in thinking about it, I mean, isn't that the whole point of an exception process is that if you lay out precisely what the requirements are to get an exception, then it doesn't become an exception, it becomes part of the rule. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, I guess, I guess philosophically, I understand there's a need to keep it a little flexible if it's going to be a quasi-judicial or legislative decision from the mayor and council to determine on appeal whether an applicant should get um, an exception if they've demonstrated with enough you know burden of proof or sufficiency or whatever we want to call it that it's that it's warranted but can you talk a little bit about that and whether sure. whether whether my understanding is right or whether we whether it might be worth thinking about if we need to have some kind of procedural language in our regulations that makes it clearer how you go about getting an exception? Right. Well, I think that's exactly the discussion that we've had with, with Crown Castle uh, and, and the other industry folks, um, you know, where they have requested some more specificity. Um, but because it is a waiver or like a variance, it is very case specific. So, um, you know, it might make sense in one location where it might not make sense in another location. It might be in a historic district. There might be environmental concerns. I mean, there's there's all kinds of factors that would go into the waiver, and I think staff was concerned if we made it so specific and included, you know, one, we can't include every possible factor because you always miss one, and that'll be the one that'll... Um, so I did want to provide some flexibility in the process there to make sure that we are considering, you know, we take into consider all consideration all particular options. I mean, again, we have had some discussion with them uh, with regard to process, and I think, you know, we've provided from the staff level some reassurances to the, the you know, how that process would, would work. Um, so I think that, you know, from a staff perspective, we don't believe it's in our best interest to have, you know, very specific criteria uh, for the waiver, because then again, as you said, then what's the need for the waiver? Then it just becomes part of your regulations. Um, the regulations are explicit on who gets to <coughs> determine the waiver, mm -hmm. which is the city council. So. Okay. Um, I just want to, it's been a while since we've talked about small selling here. I just want to 
remind everybody who's present and who's watching that that um, the whole issue it's it's been a tough issue we've we've spent a lot of time in good faith and, and a lot of a lot of meetings and a lot of homework and a lot of thought on on this the you know the council and I and staff and everybody wants to see all of our residents have access uh, to good service cellular internet everything uh, at the same time we we want to um, preserve and uh, establish our authority to regulate our rights of way for aesthetic for public safety for any number of reasons as well we want to balance this the FCC uh, is continually moving toward encroaching on our ability to uh, to regulate our rights of way uh, in doing this in the process here you know we had a comment earlier about it sort of seeming a little bit rushed it's in it's it's in our best interest to stay a little bit ahead of the FCC at the very least to to establish the parameters of of our authority um, because in a lot of cases what the FCC seems the way it seems to work legally and, and the lawyers up here can correct me if I'm wrong is the FCC would say well you know either there's a local regulation that spells out everything out that's established or if not then then carriers can come in and do whatever they want uh, without regard to to those uh, regulations and so we're we're trying to make sure all of our ducks in a row and we're establishing these regulations so that's where we're coming from it's a tough balance to strike but that's that's what we're trying to do here if I can follow that with with one um, comment the the clarification that the FCC put out just last Monday um, you know certainly they kept the January 14th effective date for much of their order dealing with fees we can charge, um, shot clocks, how quickly we have to approve applications, um, you know, a number of those issues. Uh, but they did, in, at least in their, both in their original order and then their order on their motion to reconsider, did leave authority to local governments to establish aesthetic standards, which, which is what we believe that our regulations are. Um, and that's what they gave the additional time, the 180 days versus 90 days, uh, which gives us to the April deadline uh, to get those in place. Until they impose their own mm -hmm. guidance. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. We'll which, see. Well, I think that's one of the things I'm concerned about. So, you know, it was a year ago, the, a year ago tonight or tomorrow that we adopted these regulations. So this, this isn't new, but I think the edits uh, provided uh, by staff are pretty, uh, they seem well constructed and and again, it's just an introduction. And it, well, it's an introduction, but no. I, but I, my point is, is that the regulations have been in place for a year, yeah. and that th these are edits, and there are a limited number of edits, but I think they're crucial in terms of aesthetics and and uh, other aspects um, of the of the regulation, both in response to our concerns, but I think also in response to Crown Castle and ATT. So, um, I think as much time as we can have for for public comment is a good idea. The other thing I'd like to see is actually, you know, it's not just one or two neighborhoods in the city that are going to be affected by this. It's yeah, all right. all the neighborhoods in the city are going to be affected by this. And so, at this point, we really haven't seen much representation or input from a lot of those neighborhoods. And so, I think we really need to make sure that it's well known that it's going to affect Saybrook, it's going to affect Hidden Creek, it's going to affect West Riding. Lakelands, Kentlands, Washingtonian, basically all of, you know, everything. <laughs> and everybody needs to know about it and we need to hear from as many uh, citizens who are concerned about it uh, as well. I don't imagine their concerns are gonna be much different than what we've heard, but I think it's important to make sure that we hear them, so. Are we, are we generally in agreement that we should have a public hearing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I still, I just want to come back to the fact that the reason we structured our ordinance and regulations the way we did a year ago, intentionally, um, so that the ordinance, which you know, is sort of more set in stone as a, as a statute, if you will, um, would be the framework, and that the regulations would allow us to make occasional tweaks uh, to these details um, rather quickly. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a public hearing if we think one's appropriate, but the point was this is different than having a hearing on a proposed ordinance. And it's also one of the reasons why I think we can have more of a substantive discussion at the introduction phase, because theoretically, we could vote to approve these regulatory changes tonight. 
Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to give the public more time to provide input. But the point here is precisely for the situation we're in, where the FCC is you know, rushing at us with some new rule that we have to figure out how to accommodate, we need to have this system in place so that we can tweak the regulations as needed to protect our authority. This is not to, this is not, you know, I mean, I think Judd said it well. I mean, the, the casual passerby may say, oh, you know, this is sort of like giving up your authority. Well, not exactly. It's actually making sure that our authority is drafted in careful enough way that it's preserved and that it's defensible in the event that there's, you know, some sort of litigation or anything like that that may come up. Um, so, I mean, I am concerned at the theoretical possibility that on January 15th, if we haven't finalized this, some applicant, not necessarily the ones we've been working with, but some other applicant out there could walk into court that day and say, all right, Gaithersburg's existing regulations as of January 14th don't comply with X, Y, and Z requirement of federal law or federal regulation, and then we'd, we'd be stuck. So I don't think that's likely to happen, but we don't know. Um, and I just have a little heartburn over the idea that if we extend our time frame a little bit longer and get into late January and, and early February, we do face that risk. Um, I think that our existing ordinance and regulations that are already in place are pretty defensible anyway. Mm -hmm. um, nothing's ever perfect, but um, I think you know we just have to we have to bear that in mind. Lynn, do you? <clears throat> Respond and, to that. Yeah, I mean, theoret <laughs> theoretically, that bad. is possible. And I think, again, that was part of the reason initially it looks like, you know, staff is trying to rush through this. Right. Um, you know, which was, you know, certainly not our intention, um, but, you know, the FCC is imposing deadlines on us. Um, there are, I think, a number of moving parts. I mean, I think one, the likelihood that we'll have an applicant come in on the 15th and, you know, demand some action, I think is probably not very high. Um, you know, and again, there are a lot of moving parts with uh, the FCC ruling and the federal litigation that we're s are still kind of up in the air, and there still may be a stay that's granted before January 14th. But you know, so we won't, we don't know that now. We, and know. It, we need to be. I think we're we're kind of preparing for the worst and hoping that uh, uh, you know, putting ourselves in the best position that we can. So I think that I'm I am comfortable extending um, a little bit. I mean, I think that the FCC's clarification last Monday that we have 180 days to um, to adopt aesthetic regulations does help us and gives us that little bit more time to allow some public input and you know a little bit more consideration before these come to you for final adoption and so Rob, go yeah ahead. I mean we knew this was coming I mean we, we started down this path a while ago because we knew applications were coming in and we knew that the FCC <coughs> was going to um, to to start addressing these areas through regulation and so that's why we put comprehensive regulations mm -hmm. in place um, not only to address the FCC but to 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 allow those that want to apply to to have a, a set procedures by which mm -hmm. they can be evaluated in an application so I mean <clears throat> my personal view if if we're looking at the lawyers is that you know the regulations in place um, seem to comply <coughs> for the most part with the FCC's directions that would go into in place next year um, that being said, you know, I, well, one, I think we should have a public hearing. I, I, I appreciate what appears to be a, a, a collab uh, an amicable collaboration between industry and staff, and that there seems to be broad consensus there, but what's missing from the process is public input and to the same extent that, that, that industry has that access to, to our officials. Um, and I'm not implying anything nefarious there. I just think that to fully understand the, the equation, we need to hear from the public, <coughs> particularly because we do have members of the public who have been interested in this subject that are uh, very knowledgeable in the subject, so I'd like to hear from them. Um, I, I'm willing to set the schedule as it is. I'm, I'm also not cons really concerned with the risk because we have regulations in place, comprehensive regulations in place to extend the date as well, if that's the, the choice of my colleagues. But can I ask for a quick clarification? Um, most of this, uh, the changes that we're looking at <coughs> right now are aesthetic in or in uh, size and shape and things like that. Um, I think I caught an arithmetic error, and I just want to make sure that we're dealing with the right one. And the um, changes in size in the midwire connections, antennas, et cetera, et cetera, the, I, I just want to make sure that everything I saw in the document indicates that the, what we're talking about is a 22-inch circumference 
the diagram shows a 14 inch diameter, which would be double that circumference. Yeah. Since it's pi times the diameter. We'll confirm that with Crown Castle. All right, I believe that should be a seven, 7.3 inch diameter, so which is a, you know much less unsightly. This is so. the first time pi has been used from this day, so I can remember, in a formula. Well done, Neil. Thank Harris. you. Well, when they say circumference, you've got to go, go look That's for right. pi. Yeah. yeah. But well it just didn't look, didn't look right at first glance. I do, I thank my sixth grade teacher for that one. Um, so, and, and just to weigh in on the, on the timeliness of all this, uh, I mean, do, again, doing a little bit of arithmetic, thanks to that same sixth grade teacher, if, if these facilities to ensure continuous, contiguous cell service at 5G or, uh, need to be within 500 feet of each other, and the United States is 3,000 miles by 1,000 miles approximately, that would mean 300 million facilities at a bare minimum. Now, probably that's an exaggeration because there probably won't be that many in the deserts and things like that, but realistically, there's going to be a lot. I mean, there's got, there's got to be about 100 for every square mile that needs to be covered. Um, and so on that basis, companies like Crown Castle and others have their hands full in trying to get this stuff done. And I understand the need uh, from their point of view, because of the way this technology has been designed for better or for worse, that <coughs> that's a lot. And any, any, uh, any regulations that make that go slower is an issue. On the other hand, we've got to balance the, the, the public good of having access to the latest high-speed technology and low latency and all the other goodies that come with 5G with the aesthetic issues that people have because we live here and we have homes and we have neighborhoods that have been designed to a certain standard. Um, so the, need for, the, the needs for industry can't trump <coughs> the needs for, of the people to uh, have these aesthetic concerns. So I'm very concerned about the fact that we're being pushed for these kind of un unrealistic time frames. I understand if I were industry, I'd be concerned about time frames as well, but there's a reason why things take time and why we have regulations to consider. I think the regulations that were put in place a year ago, um, you know, as much as possible, try to balance those two issues where aesthetic issues, where as many of these are possible are put out on major thoroughfares. Um, and you know, only when there's absolutely a need for it would, it would it encroach upon a neighborhood that otherwise wouldn't have these facilities. So I think what's being done is perfectly reasonable. And I, I've read the letter from Crown Castle and heard the comments today, and I'm really taken aback by the position that uh, something is being done other than what's being done to try to balance the needs of all parties. So uh, I think we're, you know, I, I feel very comfortable that we're in a position of doing what's right in order to make this work for everybody. And so on January 7th, if we had a hearing, we would have the opportunity to, to keep the record open beyond the 8th, yeah, should that's the right. input, yeah. uh, should, should we require it. So we can make, we can actually make that final decision on the 7th about yeah. how long we want to keep that record open. So well, realistically, it's a big, thick pile of papers, but most of those were documents that were agreed to a year ago, right. and just it's the changes that are really the issue, which well, are mostly yeah. outlined in this. Yes, is my point. PowerPoint. Yes. I, you know, I think the thing to remember is that throughout the United States, I think uh, twenty some states have uh, local controls already being preempted either by the state government, by uh, well, usually by the state yeah. government, whether it's a county or a municipality uh, that. Uh, that basically all of these decisions and act and regulation of the right of way, et cetera, and even fee structures has already been preempted at that level. The fact that I think when we did this, we were it was partly a demonstration to show that we could come up with reasonable regulation and ordinance that and that we could work with the industry to do that. I think we've done that. Uh, I think we've shared our uh, what we've done with other municipalities and, and counties. So I think. Um, that's important. I'm, I guess I'm not too worried, like everybody else said, about what the time frame is going to be if we delay things a little bit to give the public a chance to, uh, to talk here. So, All right. So staff recommends that we introduce the proposed regulations, and, and, and um, we have, we're determining that a public hearing is necessary. Um, so do we need a motion? To, to introduce. Is, before we do that, yeah. I, I know we've had a, th a thorough conversation. There's a couple other quick points I wanted to make, okay. if that's all right. First of all, on scheduling um, and, and making sure the public is notified, we've already talked about the <coughs> expedited schedule for this, this discussion, but 
Um, for those uh, following at home or in the audience tonight or anybody who's interested in this issue, I really do want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to sign up for our City of Gaithersburg email newsletters. I know that uh, the one on December 12th that went out to the public did, did um, mention uh, that we would be discussing this tonight at this meeting. Not every single piece of background material might have been up on our website yet, but at least we were notifying people what was happening and linking them to the project page and some of the initial information. So we'll continue to do that as much as we can. It's called In Gaithersburg. Yeah, it, it's In Gaithersburg. If you, go to, if you go to the Gaithersburg website, gaithersburgmd.gov, on the top right-hand corner, there's a link to sign up for the In Gaithersburg weekly <coughs> newsletter, emailed right to your inbox. Not, not really, not spam. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually, um, you know, edited very well to be concise and, and not to fill your uh, inbox too much. But, but there are important announcements that come in through there. And um, tonight's discussion was announced on December twelfth. But I do understand that folks get their information from different uh, forums and uh, sources, and so we're trying as best we can to send this information out in different ways. But uh, that's a good one to sign up for if you're not already on it. Um, and I, I did just really want to quickly mention there was one other item that um, um, was in the letter from Crown Castle that I just wanted to bring up because I had had some discussion with staff about it. Um, the distinction between the right-of-way occupant and the permittee, there was a concern, I guess, that that would end up being sort of like a double fee. Uh, you know, if, for example, um, a company builds... Uh, a facility and then a separate company, a telecom company, rents out a little space at the antenna on top of the facility um, that they would both sort of be, be separately paying uh, a fee to the city f for use of the right of way. My understanding of how our regulations is, are written is that while they might both have to sign some sort of agreement or indemnification, they wouldn't necessarily have to pay two separate fees. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Move to introduce the resolution Second. the public hearing date of January 7th. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. It is introduced, and we will have our, our public hearing on January 7th. Um, next, we have Tony Tomasello is going to lead us in the uh, Comcast franchise agreement discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Um, very briefly, as everyone knows, we've been negotiating with Comcast for renewal their 15-year franchise for since uh, early summer. Uh, we introduced on October 15th. We had a public hearing on November 19th. Uh, to my knowledge, we did not receive any comments um, during the uh, open open record. Um, staff and Comcast staff concur. I believe that the agreement is a reasonable extension of the partnership between the city and Comcast. It provides cable TV services only. It only relates to cable television. Um, and we're ready to um, adopt this ordinance. What's the pleasure of the council? Is there a timeline or it's just indefinite? No, it's 15 years. 15 years. 15. Okay. Would you like to um, move the ordinance? Move, Mayor, I'd like to move the ordinance. Second. To, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were gonna read the whole. It's let, not that let, her, let her do her thing. Let her. All right, sorry. Okay, so um, we are going. Josh has been very patient. I was just right. trying to move it along. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Josh. All right, so. Now my screen is <laughs> small. Okay. Mayor, I'd like to move the okay. uh, cable franchise agreement between the city of Gaithersburg and uh, Comcast for the next 15 years. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah, it carries 5 0. Technically, Thank she's you. moving in an ordinance and not the cable service franchise mm -hmm. agreement itself. Is that, does that make yeah, sense? Does ordinance. that make a difference? It's, it's the ordinance, ordinance to award yeah. renewal yeah. of cable yeah. services. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Her verbiage was moving the cable service franchise again. So I just want to make sure that we're like your vote back. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Yeah. Okay. Right. Anything to reconsider the vice presidency of the council? Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Right. Right. Okay. Dennis, I know you had something else. I think um, a number of you are aware that we have been talking with Montgomery County about participating in their dockless um, bike and also scooter implementation that they've been looking at countywide. Um, I just wanted to confirm that the council is okay with staff uh, working with them in a little bit more greater detail and developing an MOU between the city and the county 
uh, that would come back um, to you for signatory. Again, uh, this would be something they're trying to implement not only in Silver Spring and Tacoma Park where the test <coughs> markets are, uh, but also Rockville, Gaithersburg, and countywide. I think we should roll with it. Uh, oh, no. No. Oh, so we had, we had already agreed to a, a test program for the dock, the bicycle dock um, in several parts of the city. Where, are we, where do we stand on that at this point? Uh, we are still working with them on the MOU. Um, okay, so you're saying that this is not going to be a quick process. They implement it should be a quick process. We have seen their draft MOU with the, the bike um, services and the scooter services. So we've looked at that to make sure that we didn't have any big concerns, at least at the lower staff level. Um, that will go up to legal counsel once we get some additional agreements with them. It just does take them a little while, especially with the change in administration. Okay. Um, seems like we have yeah. agreement on this. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything from any other staff? Okay. Uh, well, again, uh, for those of you who celebrate Hanukkah, we, we, we hope you had a, ha a happy Hanukkah, and we wish everyone a Merry Christmas, and whatever else you celebrate, and, and a wonderful New Year. Until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned.